Are you listening? of the matter is, I don't think you're listening to me at all, and that's of great concern. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to 88.3 CKXUFM, and this is the subject for every Friday night, 7 p.m., I am your host, Ben Christensen, and in studio with me is my co-host, Mr. Thomas Stone. Good evening, all as usual. And uh, just a few uh, just a few things for those of you new to the listening to this program. Um, we are a listener interactive program, so if, uh, if and when you are prompted, uh, if you have something that you hear on our program that you want to voice your opinion about, uh, each week we uh, have a different t- uh, t- obje- topic of, our, uh, up- of discussion on the program. And so if you are interested in voicing your opinions, you're welcome to do that. We are a listener interactive program. What that means is if you want to phone in and voice your opinions on something that's being discussed, you're welcome to do so. Our phone number in studio here is 403-329-5189. Now, what that means is you'll actually have to pick up that cell phone and dial numbers instead of trying to text us because we don't receive text messages. We will take your call. (laughs) Yes. that being said, uh, you can also uh, follow us on Twitter if you're social media savvy. Uh, you can find us by using hashtag more than talk radio or uh, at the subject CKXU. That being said, uh, we now go to our favorite portion of the program, uh, this week's edition of What Happened. And uh, I'll, turn that, I'll turn it over to my co-host here to introduce our first, first of two stories. Yeah, I found this one on the uh, site Raw Story. If you haven't checked out rawstory.com, I think it is, um, you should. Um, they have some very good in, um, very good stories that you won't hear in mainstream news um, on there. Anyway, uh, I, f- I found this one. Okay, this is rather, um, uh, it's just interesting. Neighbors furious as Florida man sets up a front yard shooting range, but police say it's legal. Now, the reason I thought this was rather interesting is, of course, we did a episode uh, way back on uh, gun control. But, I mean, I, I guess I see it on both sides of the coin on this one. But at the same time, this guy says, well, he doesn't understand why the neighbors are angry at him. And uh, I, I would agree with the police on this one. Uh, it, uh, he's not damaging someone else's property. He's not causing anyone else physical harm. So, to me, what is the difference between somebody shooting a gun on their front lawn and someone shooting a high-powered uh, water gun? I mean, really, what, what is the difference? Well, I also have to clarify that this individual uh, went above and beyond his own, uh, a little bit above and beyond, because he uh, actually demonstrated neighborly antics by uh, going around, knocking on all the doors in the neighborhood, and notifying his neighbors that he was going to be doing this. So, uh, in my opinion, very, very courteous neighbor. Uh, and I, I can understand that uh, most definitely there might be some safety concerns as far as a bullet going astray or whatever. The man wants to set up targets in his front lawn and practice shooting at the targets. Uh, he's told them what days this is going to be happening. I do understand to a certain degree, but at the same time, if what you, the hell are you thinking? This is a neighborhood. This is a residential street. There's children. There's uh, there's children. There's cars. There's other neighbors' houses. And by what I read about this, he's obviously not setting up the proper. But the cops obviously don't have a problem with this, and that's maybe because... Uh, <laughs> If he ends up shooting someone else by accident, at least they have the opportunity to shoot him. I, I, I thought you actually supported this guy. Oh, I do. But uh, I, I just find it... 
I, I do have to say that um, there, there's two sides to the argument. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's obviously going to be some safety concerns as far as uh, stray bullets, uh, if he happens to misfire or you know something along that nature happens. But at the same time, this is we're talking about the United States here. This is a country that promotes gun freedom and gun rights. I mean, you want to talk about a nation that is pro-gun, that loves their guns, that loves playing with their guns and their toys and their and their big. It, 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 I, I'm not kidding. If they had the chance to hunt deer in the middle of the city at during rush hour at five in the afternoon, so help me God, I'm sure there's a gun owner somewhere that would love to do it. This yeah. is the United States we're talking about, and so I understand uh, that you know you, you have if you're using your gun responsibly. And in this case, there is some safety issues. I'm not going to denounce that, but. Obviously, this guy is a responsible gun owner. He's not running around shooting people at random. He's not shooting at random targets in the neighborhood. He's not shooting at cars or things that he just wants to uh, see go boom. He's shooting at stationary targets. Obviously, if he, he's confident enough in himself and his ability not to miss that he's can uh, continue to practice. And to me, I... I uh, it, you know, maybe not so much in the front yard, but if a guy wants to set up a gun range in his backyard, I've got no problem with that. Oh well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's there could be a difference between front yard and backyard. I understand that there's probably more concern if you're doing it in your front yard, but even still, to me, you know, as long as to to me, I don't I understand why the neighbors are making such a big deal out of this. I really don't, because if he hasn't caused damage to anyone else's property, he hasn't physically harmed anyone else. Then I don't understand what their what their issue is. Well, my attitude to be, hey, Larry, I hear you have a gun range. You mind if I come by sometime? I'll help. I'll, I'll shoot with you. Yeah, I, I probably would advise him to switch that to the backyard, just probably just to avoid problems with your neighbors. But other than that, hey, hey uh, you know what? If my neighbor wanted to open up a gun range uh, uh, and he was you know, doing it in a safe and uh, uh, and non harmful manner. I'd, I'd be all for that. Well, I mean, really, what's the difference between shooting a actual firearm, per se, and shooting a pellet gun? I mean, other than about 50 or 100 feet per second, there's really not much difference between the two objects. Well, like I say, my, my, I, I'm sort of neutral on this argument. I mean, I see both sides of the argument. I see that, yeah, there's definitely some safety repercussions here, but if this guy is a responsible gun owner, if he's told the neighborhood... He's actually taken it upon himself to notify his neighbors, this is the day and the time that I will be doing this. Then I, 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 have, to, uh, I have to say I agree with, uh, I, I have to agree with uh, Murphy or Darwin's, uh, Darwinism here. <laughs> yes. Survival of the fittest. If you're too stupid to pay attention to the fact that your neighbor is setting up a gun range in his, in his yard and he's told you and told you in advance... And you go walking by and happen to catch a bullet. Yeah. I would say that's Darwinism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I would agree with that one. I, I like I say, I understand that it can be controversial uh, as far as what he's doing, but hey, uh, new ideas. We have to constantly be looking at new ideas if we want our society to evolve. And I think that hey, it's it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, look, I I would say allow the guy to explore the new idea, see if. See if people, uh, you know, think, oh, okay, <laughs> make, I, I like this idea. You know what? Make it fun. Make it a neighborhood. Uh, make it a neighborhood event. Ha have a freaking barbecue on a gun range. Make it a fun. Make it a Sunday afternoon party. Now, of course, then you'll get all the anti-gun people going. Oh, that we just can't have our children around that. My goodness. Well, you know what? If you can't have your children around it, then don't buy them a water gun because. But it's you know what? If the anti-gun people show up to that, there's six guys with guns. <laughs> But still, like I say, I mean, who's going to win that argument? Yeah, I, 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 I get that, but I mean, it, it, like, I, of course, you're going to get, you're going to get fierce backlash if you go down there. I'm not saying he shouldn't. I think he should. I think he should try that. That's why I think he should try. He's going to get some backlash, obviously, but hey, that's society has to evolve at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on to our next, uh, next interesting story here uh, this one has got me perplexed <laughs> this one has got me scratching my head going wtf 
Yeah, I don't a, know how else to describe this. I, one. I, I am when I read this, I am speechless. I am. Uh, it, I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around this one. Uh, New York pastor suggested this week that Justin Bieber is transgendered and cut off his breasts because Obama's evil spirits misled him. Yeah. Need I say more? <laughs> when I first read that, I, was, I I just like stared at that for like 20 seconds, and then I'm like, really? Need, <laughs> need I say more? I, I mean... <laughs> just the, the absurdity of it. Who is this guy? Okay, who is this... Bible thumping religious whack job. Where is he coming up with this stuff? This is not made up by God. I mean, if there is a God, this, this God can't seriously be telling this guy that this is the way things are. I mean, this guy's got to be talking to the gods of uh, marijuana, ecstasy, or some other really great drug that he's been using because this is just ridiculous. Mm. Couldn't be marijuana, because marijuana wouldn't cause that ridiculous of a hallucination. Uh, I, I suppose you have a point there. Uh, marijuana is a little bit on the uh, on the less harsh side of things, but I don't know what drugs this guy took. Whatever it is, I'd like to try some, because I, I want to know what it's like to be so completely whacked out of your mind to come up with such absurdities. Now, this guy actually goes to the extent, in a YouTube video posted Friday stating they can be led or influenced to cut off their breasts once they get into puberty. They can be led to have operations like Justin Bieber, and they can think that the best choice for their life is to cut off their breasts. And by the time they reach the age of 20 years old, they say, I wish I had never cut off my breasts. These are comments coming from this, this loon job minister in New York. Well, other than the, the, the breasts thing, I mean... If Justin Bieber wanted to be trans, hey, no be fear. I mean... Well, maybe that's why they had to Photoshop his weenie in the Calvin Klein ads. I don't know. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe maybe that's he, why they had to Photoshop a wiener in there, because he, maybe he really is transgender and he just doesn't have one. He speaks truth. <laughs> that said, I mean, what even more ludicrous is that this individual is suggesting that President Obama, the President of the United States, the people's elected official, is perpetrating evil spirits to lead people into these sort of acts. I mean, what is this guy smoking? Yeah, I that that that. What like, I, uh, dr what what psychotropic drug did this guy take before doing this YouTube video with such absurd? ludicrous, unfounded, uh, I, there's no words to describe this. It's just comical, it's ridiculous, it's nonsensical. And this is, folks, the re exact reason that I stopped participating in religion because I'm sick and tired of these kook jobs with their uh, nonsensical ideologies. Yeah, well, that's, uh, again, another reason why we... Uh why we have the what happened section because we we love nothing more than to make f to than to make light of people's well, I, ridiculous I, idiocy. I don't mean to make fun of the religious. I I, I can condone you. I I can certainly respect that you have a choice and you've made that choice and that is your choice. But if you don't want to be persecuted, don't make it so damn easy. Because yeah. I'm sorry. This this is just. There, there's no words. <laughs> there yeah. is no words for the comically inspiring if, 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 yeah. moments of laughter that have resulted from this absurd yeah. notion. Yeah, if you like, I say, yeah, I, I've, I've got no issue. If people want to practice their religious beliefs, I've got no beef with that. But I mean, you you have to realize if you say ridiculous, absurd things, people are going to make a mockery out of you. That's just the way the world works. Although I, I, I could see, you know, going back to the original point here, I can see that uh, Justin Bieber is somebody who could have had his breath surgically removed because he does have a striking resemblance to Ellen, doesn't he? May I haven't studied his figure that much. 
I don't really even know. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> that's uh, that's our uh, that's all we have for uh, this week's segment of what happened. Uh, we're going to take a, a just a brief break to let you know about some of our great uh, CKXU friends participants. And when we come back, we'll get to this week's subject. Stay with us, and we'll be back in a moment. Get your CKXU Friends card for great deals and discounts at places around Lethbridge, such as... Receive $5.80 off of an oil change package at the Oil Changer. Located at 906 First Avenue South. Locally owned and operated since 1996. For more details, visit CKXU.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the subject on 88.3 CKXU FM. I am your host, Ben Christensen, and with me in studio, my co-host, Mr. Thomas Stone. Good evening, everyone, as usual. And this week on the subject, we are, for those of you following us on Twitter, you'll already know this, but we are talking about poverty. And boy, is this ever a very large subject itself. This should almost be a two-part series because there's a lot we have to talk about on this subject. Uh, yeah. We'll start with the definition for those who aren't familiar with poverty. And I, uh, uh, if you aren't familiar with poverty, you're probably oblivious and have been living under a rock for the last 200 years. But well, we, do, we do always have to start off with what is the definition. I mean, because... Maybe some people don't know what the definition is. Well, as I said, there there's probably people out there who've been living under a rock. If you're just joining us and coming back to modern society, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, poverty is the general scarcity or dearth or the state of one who lacks a certain amount of material possessions or money. Okay, yeah. Admittedly, I got that definition off of Wikipedia. I don't really know if I can fully agree that that is like the definition well I, I would sort of agree more with the second portion of that a definition that uh, one who lacks a certain amount of material possessions or money is probably in poverty yeah that's that does make sense like I say it's not it's not the most um it's not the the best definition but it is I guess a definition but uh, yeah I mean this this subject is um, um, one that does not receive near enough. Uh, attention and you know whether you like it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, uh, there is a great, uh, a large percentage of our Canadian population who are uh, either homeless as a result of poverty or living in uh, impoverished situations. This is not something that is exclusive to um, well, other according countries. According to Statistics Canada, thirty-eight percent of the Canadian population are within the poverty category. See, now, here's the interesting part, is I looked on tons of government websites and even Statistics Canada to get information on this. They don't, obviously, we do not take this seriously enough because the statistics are not that easy to find. And I found that uh, the government of Canada, it used to be, I don't even know if they have the same measure anymore. I remember like I think it was like four or five years ago, that I think they said if you made under fifteen grand a year, you're actually considered in poverty. And now I don't know if that's the standard today. I looked on their on the many government websites well, and nowadays, researched for this. And nowadays they've actually upped that dollar amount to eighteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah, three grand extra. <laughs> which uh, actually they thought that that would reduce the, the statistics. It actually increased it. See, that's the logic. Why would you increase an amount to try to reduce numbers? That 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 seems kind of illogical to me. Uh, well, that's just... Uh, In that, instead that, of addressing the problem, you want to reduce the numbers by upping the amount. I mean, kind of counterproductive in my from my perspective. <laughs> uh, that's just our... Uh that's just the plague of modern econo economists at work. Um, yeah, no kidding. We, we just want to look at the numbers. We don't want to look at the problem. Let's move on. Agreed. <laughs> that's the attitude. That's not our attitude, just to clarify. Yeah, that's, yeah. They, they, they have the attitude of, uh, well, these are the numbers. Uh, have a nice day kind of idea. It's, just, it's like they don't really want to give it a second glance, sadly. No. Because we're looking at poverty and we've now established what poverty is, we need to look at 
what is the cause of poverty? And uh, I go back to a show we did a few weeks, ba- a couple months ago here when we were starting out our program. Yeah, our, our housing on, one. Uh, not just our housing one, but also on consumerism, because oh, yeah. uh, consumerism, we touched on this a little bit. Um, and within the consumerism short program, we actually established that statistically, Canada and North America is one of the most wasteful nations in the world. And uh, poverty is actually a byproduct of that. Yeah, that that's uh, it's it's quite sad. I mean, you know, when I, when I look at um, I- economists are constantly saying, "Oh, well, you know, our economy is doing so well and so great." Well, to me, you have to look at it differently because what I'm seeing is, especially especially from the our consumerism episode. Um, so you got tons of people going to buy stuff, and yet there's a lot of people with high credit card bills that are barely paying for those credit card bills, and it's just like, is our economy really doing well? Or Because actually, I've actually noticed this about the last 10 years, more and more people are resorting to credit, not physical well, money that they, that they actually earned. You know, I remember talking to somebody who was a manager of a Tim Hortons location. She was always the uh, supervisor of the store, and she quite regularly worked the drive through and she was telling me that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that she saw quite often, and this was uh, one of the more popular and busy Tim Hortons locations at Gallery, it would happen, she said, probably seven times out of ten, uh, about 70% of the time, where somebody would pull up to the drive through window driving a big expensive, flashy, almost brand new, if not brand new, SUV or some vehicle uh, of a higher income bracket, such as a Mercedes-Benz, a Cadillac Escalade, you name it. Your typical, I'm a rich wiener status vehicle. I do remember you telling me this. And I find it comical that uh, what she said was the most frequent occurrence with those types of people is they were coming through to pay for a coffee that cost a dollar seventy nine. Yeah. And cheap. their credit cards were maxed out to the point where they couldn't even they couldn't even put a dollar seventy nine on credit. Yeah, that is just sad. So I guess that yeah, but yeah, there's a distinction between those who are living beyond their means and there are those who are simply not making enough to actually get themselves a foothold. There is a there is a contrast. Well, uh, those those type of folks, I honestly think they are trying to personify themselves as something that they aren't. They are putting out uh, and trying to project an image. And in my experience as, a, as an entrepreneur, as somebody in the business world, I won't deal with those types of people because... They haven't got a dime to their name. They're financially irresponsible. And actually, that uh, it's, it's unrelated, but I was looking at uh, um, a psychology study done on the types of people that drive the certain types of cars and those younger people driving the, the sportier, higher-end Audis, BMWs, typically, according to the psychology study, were financially irresponsible, and I have to agree. Yeah, that's your car thing. I, 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 to me, whatever somebody drives is whatever they want to drive. It's no reflection of who they are, in my opinion. But I guess getting back to the um, the subject here, uh, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> um, it, you know, there's this this issue to me is there. We we do have a lot of people. I mean, I mean. I think that uh, the average person can walk down the street and even downtown Lethbridge or downtown Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver. I've been to all cities, uh, all those cities, and they're, you know, Vancouver's doing better, but especially Alberta here, uh, we're gonna, not doing very well. I'm going to point something out. Uh, just to give an example of somebody that would be classified as being in poverty would be somebody who is working minimum wage, Earning ten fifty an hour, working forty hours a week, bringing approximately twelve hundred dollars a month home gross before tax. After tax, maybe around eight fifty nine hundred dollars, and from that, they've got a rent of about we'll say seven hundred, leaving them two hundred dollars. And of that two hundred dollars, they now have to pay a hundred dollars on insurance. That leaves them a hundred dollars, and of that hundred dollars, they've got to spend forty on gas. 
that leaves them $60. And by the time they've done paying everything down and covering their very, and this is not including food, by the way. Yeah. Somebody like that who is, if they're lucky, able to pay just their core basic living costs. That would be somebody who is defined as the image of poverty. Somebody who is trying their best to get ahead to uh, create you know, some form of financial stability for themselves, yeah. but are barely getting by, pay, living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, and I, I think that these people are way too often um, they're way, they're too often criticized for being societal leeches and everything else, which I think is just absolutely disgusting. It's I mean, it's, do your homework on something before you accuse them of anything. But I mean, actually, the government of Canada actually has their own measure. I'm not sure if I really fully agree with this measure, but their measure is I think it's thirty percent. If you're spending above thirty percent, which is roughly one third of one's total paycheck on on uh, housing, then if you're spending above that, then you're spending too much. If you're spending under that, then you're doing well. Well, going back to our housing costs episode, um, it was established by the CMHC, the Canadian Mortgage, Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, that a low-income person was classed as somebody who is paying uh, more than 70% of their monthly gross income towards base living expenses for shelter, uh, that being essentially rent and utilities. That's uh, it's, a, it's a fairly reasonable measure. But uh, one thing I, I, I definitely do want to you know, completely dismiss before we get too far is this idea that you know uh, those in poverty, I've heard the accusation so many times that those in poverty uh, choose to be there, that they're being irresponsible with their money, and that if they worked hard enough, they could get out of it. Um, that is so not true. I want to I wanna put that out there right. That is not true true because I know if, I've known of so many people who are working in excess of 12 hours per day full time and they're still scraping by that that yeah. is the state of affairs in this country and to add to that I've met lots of people who work 60 plus hours a week are f employed full time have a pretty good income and they are still struggling to survive now, that brings us to the next question. What is causing all this? What is the problem here? Well, I think it's, um, there's, there's many factors. One, I think, um, you know, I actually, uh, I was a couple, many years back, well, not many, it was about five plus, I can't remember exactly, I think it was back in 2010, roughly, 2009, 2010. Um, I actually was tr trying to produce a documentary on this issue. Um, from the from Calgary, actually, uh, unfortunately, never it never got done. But I talked to a lot of people in the mustard seed, and what they actually said, what, these people who were homeless in poverty, were saying, is that employers are using the system in order to just generate themselves a bigger buck in the end. What they mean by using the system is, they say, well. I can't put a lot of jobs on my resume, even though I've worked 20 different jobs, because I couldn't keep those jobs for more than three months. So what happens is I have many skills to offer this employer. I go to this employer, and after three months, which is the probationary period, they basically say, oh, well, it's not working out, or some other lame excuse, and then they get fired from the job, even though they were doing a good job. It's basically part of This is a lot to do with employers that are just using the system to get themselves in a better position financially at the expense of other persons, other people's hard work. And that, to me, is disgraceful. Well, that, by the definition in North America, is called capitalism. Yeah, now, it never works. I don't necessarily endorse the mindset of capitalism, but I do believe that there is, a, you know, in any business— it does not matter what your business is. It does not matter what you do. It does not matter what product you offer, what service you offer. Your business will not succeed without good employees. And here's an example, and we've used it before. We look at Walmart, we look at Costco. Walmart employees are miserable, 
unhappy, and they have one of the highest turnover rates for retail franchises in the world. Now we go to Costco. Costco employees are happy. They have a high morale. They've been at their job for years upon years. And they are satisfied with their employers. Yeah. You want to know what the difference is? Costco pays their employees well. Yeah. And treats their employees with the attitude that their business is the byproduct of their employees. Well, that's the thing is it's it's better economically, even from a business perspective, even if you even if you do believe in capitalism, it makes more logical sense to you know, if somebody is contributing to your company, they're doing a good job, they're coming to work on time, they're giving you good results and yielding you better profits. Why would you fire that person for the sake of not wanting to pay health benefits? I mean, you're firing somebody who is contributing to your higher profit margin, and you want to get rid of them because you don't want to have to pay out benefits. You know what? I, I actually have had the I, I've had uh, businesses in the past where I've had one or two different uh, one or two employees, and I will tell you, I've had both sides of the spectrum. I've had employees that hate uh, that have hated working for me because they weren't didn't feel like they were getting paid enough. I asked them how I could fix that. They told me how I could fix that. I made it right. I've also had employees who have come to me and said, I really like working for you. I think you're a great employer. And I'm content with my pay. I'm content with how you treat me as an employee. And I want to keep working for you and helping you grow your business. And that is ultimately... One of the key factors that I think would help to change this poverty scene that we see in North America. And one of the things I have actually, I've gotten quite a, ba- quite a bit of criticism for even proposing this. But hey, you know what? Um, as, as I forget who said it, but uh, all great truths begin as blasphemies. That, that's so true. I would be in favor, and I think this is, this is uh, I don't think this is absurd at all. I'd be in favor of a minimum wage of, fif- of at least $15 an hour across the spectrum. Minimum wage, $15 an hour. Now, a lot of people have told me, well, that's just beyond ridiculous because, oh, well, uh, you know, somebody who's working a low-end cashier job doesn't deserve to get paid that much. Excuse me? If somebody is, con- if somebody is putting in, Jesse Ventura even said this, if somebody is putting in full-time work, it doesn't matter what kind of job you're doing, if you're putting in full-time work, you deserve to get paid something that will give you a life. And $10 $11 an hour is not going to do that. So I think that it's it starts off with wages. And uh, we'll, um, we'll come back with a break after this. But I just want to say here that even if the cost of products goes up by a few dollars to accommodate that, I'm fine with that. And I agree 100% with that. As a business owner... I see no difference in the cost of operating my business to keep my employees happy because ultimately it costs me more in the end to train new employees, to hire new employees, and to pay people to find those new employees than it does for me to pay a few bucks extra to keep a good one. We'll be back in a moment. We've reached the halftime part of our show where we usually play a nice little tune. And uh, yet again, our randomness of selections from the CKXU studio. We've got uh, this week uh, an album called Dig Your Roots Electronic Dance and uh, we're playing you a track called Ballad uh, Ballad of the Lonely Mogway by an artist out of Winnipeg called Balboa. So I hope you enjoy that. We'll be back in just a few minutes, folks.
Welcome back, hey, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're listening to The Subject on 88.3 CKXU. I'm your host, Ben Christensen, and with me is uh, my co-host, Mr. Thomas Stone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, that was our musical break. Uh, I better go check the fax machine. I think we got multiple faxes during that song. <laughs> Possibly. At least that's what it sounded like for a moment there, anyway. Yeah, no kidding. But uh, that's topic for another day. As usual, yeah. yes. Uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about poverty. Um, the causes and, um, I guess, the economic uh, source of poverty. And now we're going to get into a little bit, uh, sort of a shifting uh, of thought here. Well, we want to focus now on a group of people who is probably, by far, the biggest subjects of poverty, the student population. Now, obviously, we're we're uh, we're hosting this show from a uh, fine uh, post-secondary establishment, so we don't want to be too critical. However, I would say that um, us I, I, critical. Or when have we ever been critical? <laughs> we are, we're quite critical a lot of times, but um, I, I, I to me. Uh, I've, I've, because I, I've heard this this accusation so many times from people who are of higher income who don't understand the issues of lower income. Oh well, if you want to make more money, and you want to make a better life for yourself, go back to school and get some training. Now I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna throw that one right in the dark right now. I'm an entrepreneur. I've met a lot of other entrepreneurs. I've met some who are multi-millionaire, multi-millionaire entrepreneurs who have done very well for themselves. And guess what? None of them have ever set foot in a classroom. Actually, um, and also to solidify your point, um, I'm not sure if our listeners know, but uh, there's a, a very widely known show known as The Dragon's Den on CBC. Uh, I'm sure many of you have probably seen this show, but you'd be also, I don't know if you'd all, if you, if uh, our listeners would know this, I, I think none of them, none of the dragons, um, at least in the last season anyway. None of them have ever completed a post-secondary education. Yeah, they don't have business degrees, yet they're all millionaires. Now, we're not trying to denounce education because that's not the purpose of this program. And right. it's certainly not the focus of this subject, uh, this week's topic. Um, that said... I think it's important to illustrate that uh, there are a lot of students who attend these fine facilities um, in hopes of a, a better career opportunity, a better job. And in order to do that, they're putting themselves in a very uncomfortable position. They're putting themselves into mass amounts of debt to cover their tuition with student loans, student financing, and even their own personal lines of credit in order to pay tuition and all of the expenses associated with being a participant of the educational faculties. Yeah. And uh, um, to me, sorry, go ahead. to me, I don't denounce that there is some careers that students should attain an education for. But what statistics show is that even though you believe that that degree you receive at the end of this is going to get you that dream job. Statistics have shown that that's just simply not the case, and as a result, there are a lot of great people out there who are you know, top of their class, who are fine, hardworking students, who are now paying off thousands of dollars worth of debt for a piece of paper that did them no good. Well, I, I think it's important, like I say, to point out here that, um, like, I've I've seen this this issue of poverty. It it's ever growing issue because I mean, if you think back like twenty years ago, twenty twenty five years ago, something like that, the only people you would ever see typically in an impoverished situations are people who, um, f who were able to work, who refused to work, and. You know, uh, and individuals like that. Nowadays, there it's such a much larger uh, issue. It's not just you know. There's a lot of people who are in those situations who are working. So that's what I'm saying. I want to make sure we get the distinction because so long ago it wasn't the way it is today. Now today we're seeing um, so many more people struggling who 
you know, 20 years ago wouldn't have those struggles because it's just the well, economic was, landscape it, is so much different. It was a totally different scenario in, in the scheme of things 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And back then, instead of going into business or going into this career or that career, with the exception of being a doctor or a lawyer, topic for another day, yeah, I'll get no kidding. Um, other than a few select uh, career options, people really didn't attend educational post secondary education. It was a, it was fifty, sixty years ago. It's not something that was as as rampant as as it is now. And I think that the educational uh, the educational system through and through has found in a way to exploit this brainwash people over the last few generations to believe that they absolutely have to have an education put themselves in debt and ideally uh, ultimately they're creating more poverty than they are helping it yeah i mean if uh there's actually a meme i saw like we i don't know how long felt how far how far back it was but uh um I, I think it was, it was um, somebody that was much older than me uh, posted this. I I couldn't disagree with it more. Basically showing you know twenty year olds in World War Two you know fighting for everything, and then a picture of twenty year old college students protesting higher tuition. That says you know oh well twenty year olds nowadays complaining about everything. And to me you know what I I just so disagree with it. I think the students have every right to complain about higher debt levels just to get themselves. A supposedly better life. I uh, I support them in that. I think that they do have the right to voice their opposition to that. Well, there it, there is this promise of a greater lifestyle, this higher lifestyle, this higher quality of life that is programmed into students when they enter these educational facilities. And again, I'm not knocking the educational system. I think it is a great thing. Yeah, one but does need education. Why is it that if the educational faculties are so good at creating a higher quality of life that so few students who are graduates of their programs are ever able to get into the field of work that they spent two years or four years learning about and trying to get into? Yeah, uh, and like I say, poverty... Um, I, I think that when the average person thinks about poverty, probably the first image that comes to their mind is some homeless guy, probably weather-beaten with a really torn-up jacket, ripped jeans. You know, that's kind of the stereotypical view. And the thing that's, is, that's it's, a perceived image of poverty. But people aren't receptive to this idea that somebody who might be still dressed in nice clothes, might still drive a nice car, might still have a nice place to live is still without money and resource to cover their bare and basic needs. Yeah, like I say, I, I go out with uh, Jesse Ventura's comments on this. Uh, basically, if it doesn't matter if you're doing the low-end job cashier or if you're our manager somewhere. If you're putting in full-time hours somewhere, uh, you, you deserve to get paid a wage that you can live on. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter what the job is, if you're, if you're putting your heart and soul into a job and you're working as hard as you can to get by, you deserve to get paid for those efforts. And I don't. I, I disagree with this idea of creating a sort of class system where, yeah. you know, a, a Tim Hortons cashier should somehow get paid less, uh, you know, than somebody else. I mean, uh, I completely agree with you on that. Um, we're just going to take a little bit of a break here um, and let you about know, let you know about some of the other great programs here on CKXU. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a moment here on the subject. Tune in every Tuesday at 5 to CKXU 88.3 or CKXU.com for Bean Spouts, where you'll hear some of my music and also spouting some nonsense with some friends. The Bean Spouts, planting the seeds of my music taste in the garden of your ears. Yeah, 
Welcome back here to the subject on 88.3 CKXU. I'm your host, Ben Christensen, and with me, my co-host, Thomas Stone. Uh, continuing where we left off before the break there, we are talking about uh, the yeah, poverty as a whole. And we do remind our listeners that uh, for about the next 10 minutes, we still have some time. If you want to phone in and share your opinions, you can do that by calling our studio line here, 403 403- Three two nine five one eight nine. Yeah, well, Let us know how you feel and what you're thinking. What's on your mind? We yeah, want to hear from you. Yeah, about five minutes is. Uh, try to call in the next five minutes because we got to wrap up here soon. Like but I say, we got about ten, uh, five, ten minutes left in the show. Um, so if you have something to say, give us a call in the next. You know, 10 if, minutes. Especially you know if you're working poor and you're sick and tired of people rejecting you, even though you've got skills. Hey, we want to hear from you. I I've heard that story so many times. I think you know. I think I, I it's. This issue of poverty um, is, it's very big. It's not getting near enough attention. Yeah. And there is a class of people out there who are fighting to put food on their table and they are getting shunned and criticized by society because they're not making enough money or whatever the reason may be. Just before the break there, we were talking about the uh, you know, how education plays a role. So uh, people are going to school, getting these educations and putting themselves into mass amounts of debt and getting nowhere from it and that is most definitely a contributing factor to poverty. I want to I want to touch here on another one and that is the employers themselves. And I believe without a doubt that the employers are probably the biggest culprit in contributing next to the government of course because well organized crime is what it is. Yeah, we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave that. We're going to leave that alone. We are not here to be political. Um, the employers in this world are single-handedly probably the biggest culprits in the poverty circle. Oh, yeah. And the reason I feel that way, I have been an employee. I have been an employer. I've been on both sides. And me, I am the kind of guy, if I've got somebody working for me, I value hard work. I value somebody who is making my business look good. I value somebody who is putting their ass on the line day in and day out to help me further my interests. I have respect for and I value employees who are like that. I do not respect employers who treat that type of employee the hardworking, job-loving, enthusiastic employees, the ones that are making you look good, I do not condone employers who treat those employees like trash. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think that's disgraceful. One thing that actually I just, I just occurred to me, I want to get this out there. So, you know, everybody who is in this category um, gets represented. The one thing that bugs me more than anything is when people criticize a disabled for you know supposedly being leeches in society and being contributors to their own poverty you know what to me it is the most shameful thing to bash somebody on disability because you know what S- depression is a serious issue and uh, i think that uh, as a society you know i've heard so many people th- say oh well uh, it's it's unfair for me to be working a full time job but contributing to the welfare check of somebody else. And so you know what? In essence, what you're saying is that somebody who is on disability who may not necessarily have a physically visible handicap is being criticized. And I agree with you. It's unfair. Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, like I said, I I made my comments before saying you know, if you are working full time, you deserve to get. Um, you know, a, a reasonable, you deserve to be able to live a happy and reasonable life. Now, those who aren't able to work deserve just as much of a reasonable life. And to me, you know what, I, I think it's, uh, I think uh, that we should be complaining more about the politicians. Like I said, I'm not trying to get political here, but I think, you know what, to me, some politician who's taken $150,000 of my tax money to do nothing is a far bigger issue than the person getting a sixteen hundred dollar ace check, it's a to me. You know what? That sixteen hundred bucks, I don't even care about it. Take that money. It's and it's rightfully theirs. I, I have to agree with you. I uh, getting back to what I was saying. Uh, employers to me, as I said, being on both sides of the spectrum, 
I think that employers are, as I said, the biggest yeah. culprit. And those who are disabled are just a victim of an unfortunate circumstance. They're forced into poverty not by choice, but by circumstance. And that is negligent on our part. That is negligent on our government's part. And that is negligent uh, on society's part as a whole to to criticize and to to speak ill against people who are unable to support themselves unless they're given that help. Uh, especially outrages me. I know this one's garnered a lot of criticism, but I mean, we're running out of time here. But uh, you know, if uh, if any veterans are listening, I support you. I feel sorry. I apologize to you on behalf of our of my government. I am quite frankly ashamed of how my government is treating you. You have my undying respect. You guys deserve every darn penny that you get. And I am so sorry that you guys are being shafted royally. You uh, deserve so much more. As I say, the, these are all types of people that are being forced into poverty, not necessarily by choice. And we, we're sitting here pointing the finger and doing the finger wagging at them because they receive government support. Yeah, it's... I don't think you people who are doing that finger wagging, who tell them go and get a job, if you people for one month had to live on the amount of pitiful, disgraceful, pathetic income that our governments see fit as a reasonable amount to cover the base living costs, you'd have a different opinion. Because no, no. I can tell you, if you're paying, a, if you're living in a space that costs you nine hundred dollars a month to rent, and you're only getting six fifty, which is what a lot of these pensioners are getting, what the hell are you living on? And, yeah. and quite frankly, what the hell gives you the right? Yeah, uh, going to quickly, um, going back to what you're saying about employers, you know, I, I agree with you. It, it used to be, you know, like 15, 20 years ago, that you could that a person with le next to no skills could walk into their local Seven Eleven gas station, whatever, and you get a job within a couple of days, pumping gas or doing a cash register or something low end, and you'd have no problem. Nowadays, it seems like not even a person with no skills can get, you know, even the baseline job. Well, here's a good example. I know somebody that uh, was self-employed for several years, went out. He's looking for just the most basic, baseline job. And nobody will hire him because he's been self-employed, because he's of an entrepreneurial mindset. He is not an employee. He's the, he's the employer, has that mindset. Nobody wants to hire him because he doesn't share the employment mentality and to me it's pitiful no oh, yeah. a job is not a privilege a job is a necessity of life and it does not matter what walk of life you come from you deserve to have one if you have the desire to have one and nobody and i do mean nobody should be left in the dirt sucking the dust barely scraping by at the hands of the employers who are perpetrating this poverty because the employers have the right to hire more employees major corporations are not starving for money but they're cutting jobs each and every day why wow. because they want to keep the money for themselves and to me that is the ultimate contributor to what we're seeing on the poverty realm I actually wanted to quickly go back to one comment I made before about, um, you know, the issue of uh, I propose a $15 an hour minimum wage. Now, a lot of economists and a bunch of other critics have said, well, if you do that, the um, cost of overall products is going to go up by a sub substantial amount. But actually, analysts have looked at this, okay, if you had a $15 an hour minimum wage, which is what a lot of other countries actually have right now, the average cost of products that we pay for would only go up by about 2 or $3. dollars matter of fact, it would actually go down because of supply and demand. Mm, well, well, there you go. I mean, that's, some, that, that, that's the thing. Is this, this idea that a higher minimum wage means higher costs is not necessarily true. And to me, the employers, you know, especially the big corporations who are bringing in the billions um, there's no excuse for them not to pay a well, decent living wage. 
I, I, I'm going to add, uh, leave us on one final thought here. I fully agree. I do not think that ten fifty an hour, nine seventy five an hour, or anything below ten dollars an hour is nearly enough to survive on. The basic living, livable amount of income that anybody should receive now is fifteen dollars an hour. I think that the government needs to consider that, along with inflation, the cost of average living costs has gone up. That minimum wage is still sitting at a standard which was assessed by the government. In 1987, yeah. only recently did we raise minimum wage from not eight uh, in the last few years. I think uh, at one point it was 8.75. Now when it went up to 9.50, and now it's around 10.50 an hour. Still not good enough, but we're getting there. So yeah. let's put it up another five bucks an hour. I guarantee you, what we'll see, we'll see an economic boom. We'll see job stability. We'll see, uh, we'll see more surplus money coming into the economy. Greater tax revenues. This is all a byproduct of a higher earnable living cost. And the government, the employers, and other organizations responsible for poverty are doing their very best to ignore this in order to make a few extra bucks. On that note, we'd like to thank you for listening to the subject here on 88.3. Just a brief reminder that you can always call into our program. Now is not the time, but... Anytime during the program from about 7 o'clock p.m. when we start the show up until about 7.50 p.m., you're more than welcome to call in and voice your opinion on any of the topics we're discussing here on the subject. Our studio line hasn't changed. This number's always the same. If you know how to use a phone, it's very <laughs> easy. Pick it up, push the numbers, and you'll hear a little dial tone. If that dial tone starts going bring, bring, you know you got the right number. And if somebody says hello, you know you dialed the right number. Our phone number here, 403-329-5189. Also, make sure you find us on Twitter if you're social media savvy. Hashtag more than talk radio. That's all we. That's all for this week, folks. Thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week. Enjoy your weekend.